Welcome, heathens and witches, to the Horn and Cauldron Podcast. Podcast. Pub Chat Edition. We're drinking Bev's here. Bev's. Bev's. Uh, Bev's in tiny, fancy glass. She's got a tiny, fancy glass. I, I have a regular glass this time, but it's Pranch. This is, uh, what is this? Was that wine that I got? Cream sherry. Cream sherry and orange soda. And I'm just drinking uh, port. Like an absolute fancy homeless person. Yeah, and I've got port. So we're... Uh, because I was drinking the cream sherry straight, and I realized that I'm going to drink it way too fast. Uh, if yeah. I don't cut it with something. Because I drink that brandy, like, very fast. So... <laughs> that's what we're doing tonight. Anywho, I'm John Norgrove. This is Julie Norgrove. This is the Horn and Cold and Pod Pass Hub Chat Edition, which is the off weeks where I am in charge. Lock up, lock up the horses and the wives. Jonathan's in charge. Okay. You know, whatever whatever that country song is. Um, somebody knows what I'm talking about out there. It's not me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, this is the Pub Chat thing. We're going to do... Uh, what our pub chat question is, but to be different than the way that we normally do these things, you know, because change is how reality works. Ooh, reload everything, huh? Good for you, Patreon, the app. Um, so we asked our patrons which topic we should do for this week's pub chat. And our patrons don't like me. <laughs> thank you for expressing the unlove um because it was a perfect tie yeah between the three potential topics three-way tie three-way tie thank you so fan. very fun very fun so we decided to do a pub chat on dune because like we had been talking and uh we were like i don't know we were driving around doing errands or something and we were talking about like different like ideas and like a bunch of ideas came up for what we should do the pub chat on and i was just like We'll put it to the patrons. Then we can stay focused. And the patrons were like, thank you, Will. Uh, so yeah. like that. And so, so uh, boom, I guess we're going to do all three. So we're I'm not going to tell all the questions at once. We're just going to go down. All right. And in, in just the order that the list was made, the list was also not made in any particular order. Uh, I look forward to our next poll. Uh, I feel like this might be one of those things that I forever regret is having polls. But ah, the I'm next keep... poll is mine. But we're gonna keep doing it. So, so whatever. It's mine. We'll, so. we do all three in one in one podcast. Oh uh, no. Yeah. No, we're not. No, that's the rules. I'm setting up rules right now. Nope. Yeah. <sighs> because you know what? When I Put do the poll, up, rule. No, when I do the poll, I am this, also the tiebreaker. Look at this crown. Rule. That's not a crown. That's your hair. Yeah. <laughs> same thing, right? Same, same. Hair crown. You know about hair crowns? Just read the question. Yeah. <laughs> So the first question is, how does the voice, in quotes, from Dune work? So, how does the voice from Dune work? Uh, whatever, spoilers for Dune 1 and 2, but really it's just spoilers for the book of Dune, because we're going to be talking about both the, cinem the cinematic Duneiverse, and, uh, yeah, um, as well as the book, because yeah. there actually are differences between the two. Yes. So, firstly... How is it exemplified in the two systems? So in the book, Dune, the voice used by the Bene Gesserits, as well as, like, obviously, Paul Moadim, Lisa Um, uh, So the voice basically works by them, like, reading a dude, like, cold reading a person, like they're doing uh, crowd work style magic. Yeah. And, like, getting, like, a, like, I understand this guy's character. And then essentially being able to just calculate what inflection and tone of voice is most likely to influence that person. So kind of technically in the book, it's not at all magic. It's just like a remarkable amount of training and vibes. Yes. However, um, many people who practice magic and do sort of um, quote unquote magical things as like a job employ the tactics of cold reading someone yeah um so that's from not, from like it's not an cold uncommon way to, to like that. the cards underneath the stage and a person with a microphone in your ear or like a tube in the floor or whatever the fuck yeah. cold reading um so like you know it still requires a significant amount of skill and training to be able to do but it's not like as woo-woo as it is presented in the book. 
or is it, in excuse the, me in the movie because in the movie it appears to be like accessing a like tone you know like the like you know uh what's the one like the, the brown note or whatever the fuck you know the like conspiracy theories um you know about the brown note conspiracy theory no that there's like a frequency that makes anybody i'm gonna stop you right now off. This is uh, the one for the for the episode. You can't do good, it anymore. Good fucking luck with that. <laughs> There's uh, no other. Absolutely can't do it anymore. Good luck with that. But so it's sort of like there's like a control note. So like, you know, it's not brown, but it's, you know, whatever. The voice color. And yeah. um, so at that frequency, you get you just immediately influence everybody. And it yeah. kind of works universally. It seems like is in the in the movie, they specifically uh, Jessica tells Paul early on that he needs to like pitch his voice lower. So it it seems that it is a specific frequency, like it just works. Yeah. As opposed to in the book where it's like kind of different for each person. You got to know what you're doing. Yeah. Right. Whereas in the movie, it's a bit more like everybody is affected by the same tone. By, by like and, that. And this frequency. one, I feel like is definitely is more like magicy looking. Oh, the the movie is. Way more magical. Yeah. Also, aside, right? Let's take pause two steps to the left. In the 1980s movie, the voice is words of power, and the word of power for destroy is what they can speak into a box and then fire like a bullet to destroy things because they skip a lot of stuff in that movie. And so... <laughs> For an abundant, like an oversimplification, an abundant lack of detail, they basically, Paul is just like, listen, guys, I got this box. It's like a loudspeaker. And we're going to say, oh, I'm going to teach you a word. And you say this word into the box, but you say it in sort of like not as cool a way as I think they thought it was when they first came up with this idea <laughs> in the studio. Uh, and then it's going to blow stuff up. And so they're basically just going like, boom. And then like whatever they're trying to boom at just booms. That it's, I think is the most magical of the three. Well, except it, they're using a box for it. So like imagine a loudspeaker, you know, like a like a bullhorn that like a cop uses. Imagine that. But the outlet side of that is a pressure wave that can shatter rocks. You know, like a sonic yeah, cannon. Yeah. So it's like, it is both more magical that power words somehow do this, as well as less <laughs> magical because it's literally a piece of technology. We're not really talking about the 80s movies, but I just had to bring that up because it's like kind of the voice and kind of not the voice. It's, the 80s movie takes like a lot of weird left hand turns <laughs> from the source material. I love that movie for how bonkers it is, uh, but it's it whatever. It exists. Uh, I recommend Kind of, uh, but uh, yeah, I think the I think the the uh, Villeneuve movie certainly makes it far more magical. Yeah, and at that point, it, if it is magical like that, I feel like it's um, it it must have something to do with like some sort of like hind brain, like yeah. some sort of like mind taking power. You yeah. know, it's like a like a physical representation of a like a psychic. Butch, well, and you know? also, I it has like intention built into it. Right? Yeah, well, so... and like if you're like if I have voice, but it's like bitch made, and Julie has voice, but it's like OP. They're like I can't voice her. Yeah, yeah. right. Which is what makes it in the movie, which they like kind of touch on this, but like not well in the movie. Um, but in the book, it's it's significantly more important when this happens. But like when Paul voices. The um the Bene Gesserit for the uh emperor the e emperor I mean yeah um for that's wrong book series. yeah wrong book series <laughs> that's like a very big deal right because she's conceptually like one of the most powerful yeah and for Paul to voice her and for her to immediately obey and not be able to resist the voice yeah because the Bene Gesserits can also like again if it's a lower tier Bene. Um, a smaller Jesserit. A smaller Jesserit. <laughs> um, like you can sort of like overcome the voice and not have it mind take you. Yeah. Right. Uh, so him being able to do that, it's like, oh my god, like he's an old lady, you know. So, so, so like, there's that. But I think, from my perspective, the book is the way that I look at it. The book is almost entirely non magical. Yeah. Right. It is. It is sleight of hand. Right. Yeah. It's a practice skill, you know, like, again, close up street magic. And I like 
I'm not digging on it or close up street magic by saying it this way, but like close up street magic where you're like, yeah, the ball disappeared, but like actually the dude just like palmed it and then fired it behind him. And he's got another ball in his pocket for later on or whatever the heck, right? It's all misdirection and intrigue. Yeah. Whereas in the movie, it's purely just mind taking like yeah. straight up low jack wizard shit. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. just, it's just I magic. Actually, powers. I actually very strongly prefer the way that they do the voice in the movie than in the book. I also like the voice in the movie over the book. As much as I love the practical nature of the voice in the book, I think the fact that it's not like it's, it's glancingly explained in the movies and it's essentially just magic in the movies gives the Bene Gesserit like more like it gives them more juice. It gives them yeah. more power. They're like way more threatening where they're not just like, ah, oh, yeah, I just like palmed that guy's watch and then like put it in my pocket yeah. and then like accidentally dipped into this lady's purse. And then five minutes later was like, is this your watch? <laughs> and everybody's like, yeah. like, like it's, it's way cooler that it's just like, shut the fuck up. And everybody's like, you know, like that's yeah. very cool. Yeah. You know, it makes it way more rad. In my it does. Opinion. It absolutely uh, But does. yeah, I, in my mind, from a practical, magical standpoint, right, to like bring it back, um, I think that it is just a mental push. It's just like a psychic push, right? It's it's the inverse of um, um, empathy, right? So our em our empathic sense is is reading somebody else in ourselves right mm -hmm. being able to like read it's the opposite of that it's being able to write ah, right it's the yeah, it's the cdrw <laughs> of inf of a uh, uh, empathy it's the cassette tape that doesn't have the little pieces yeah it's out. the it's the piece of tape over the back for of like the vhs all, tape for like know? all two of you there that, yeah. that are old enough to know yeah you know when you put a little piece of tape on a vhs tape and then just re-record over that vhs tape 48 million times yeah right yeah. um yeah i think it's like that yeah right? so it's, yeah. it's a push instead of a pull um which which is very interesting, right? Yeah. So agreed. like I think that that's the like practical method that they're doing is it's it's running on the same channels as empathy, which there is some like mechanical structure to the idea of empathy, right? Uh, we have uh, mirror neurons in our head that appear to be able to, uh, and like I'm I am not an expert in this, and I am giving you like the most absolute back of a cereal box explanation about how this works. I am not a doctor. I am nowhere close to a doctor. I played one on TV, but that doesn't count. Um, but uh, so our mirror neurons essentially do this thing where when we observe somebody, they appear to facsimilate the way that person is processing information, which would allow us to be able to. So it's sort of like when you're trying to understand somebody or empathize with somebody instead of like your brain trying to cold process that like, okay, this person is moving this way. So they're doing this and this person is moving this way. So they must be thinking this way, right? You know, they're, they're shrugging their shoulders or their facial expression saying this. So they must be thinking this way, which is cause and effect chaining. What your mirror neurons do is they essentially run a run, a uh, like pseudo version of that person's mind in that moment, based on all of the little shit that your conscious brain can't pick up, all those like microtransactions on the face and in the hands and the shoulders and the manner in which they're talking and the speed at which they're talking and, and whether or not you can notice, uh, you know, uh, like flushing in different parts of the body or sweating on different parts of the clothes or or any of that like body language stuff, as well as like analyzing um, sound, yeah. right? Your mirror neurons take that data and uh, and essentially facsimilate the person you're trying to empathize with inside of your head. So you're running sort of like a second pseudo consciousness for like a split second. And your brain's able to then sort of like like pass over that consciousness and be like, ah, this is how they're moving down that path. Yeah. Right. Uh, and also mirror neurons are affected by electromagnetic fields, which means that there is some kind of science that says that maybe with enough development mirror neurons would technically allow us to be able to share or read information 
from other people's minds since a portion of our mind is an electromagnetic thing and yeah. not just a chemical thing. I mean, that is like Wait a very loose science, but it is kind of technically We're also there. like 10,000 years in the future, so. Yeah, so like maybe Hundo Pasundo, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and they're all mad genetically selected and engineered to be better humans or whatever. And like very very diligently trained yeah exactly yeah. exactly so whatever i like like if the voice were a real thing it's probably like a mirror neuron empathetic push yeah right uh so the second thing the second question was is spice from the dune franchise just lsd in the sand yes uh next and the answer to that is yes next question yes next question obviously it's just lsd um, or maybe it's DMT. Um, I, I don't know that it really matters. I don't know that it matters either. It is, but it's definitely, um, you know, it's definitely like a nootropic kind of thing. Totally. It's that, totally um, nootropic. That gives you like hallucinations uh, in addition to it. One of the things that we know about um, nootropics, so nootropics uh, are... Um, substances, whether that's like a plant or a chemical that sure, affects novel Tropicana. What novel Tropicana? No, what? No, <laughs> that doesn't even make sense. That's not even shorter. No, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, a nootropic is um is is a substance that makes it so that you are your your brain is like more calm. Um, and sort of like evens you out a little bit. This makes uh, really an ideal environment for um, other types of substances to help you with, um, you know, like perhaps you're needing um, anti-anxiety type of medication or anti-depression or your... Um, you know, you have some other, like, you, you have something, you have some other like, uh, PTSD or, yeah, you, you know, you have so, something so, like, else there, but it help also with all that stuff helps the right conditions. with hallucinogens and many hallucinogens also, uh, have a nootropic, um, component to them. Mm -hmm. The most natural one that I can think of that's like not, not, uh, like, um, not like an illegal one is, uh, Blue Lotus. So Blue Lotus is a nootropic, um, so is bergamot actually um so those are both nootropics but bergamot you know like earl gray tea hot um <clears throat> does not induce hallucination he gray gray hot oh no y'all we're fired, getting into guys yeah we're getting into like, <laughs> don't worry you know what end of the podcast everybody go home i gotta figure out how to divorce yeah so <laughs> So Earl Grey is flavored with bergamot and bergamot doesn't induce um, hallucinations, uh, but it is a nootropic. But um, so you can kind of like see the difference between that. There are and a lot Blue of substances Lotus. that we consume that at the right amount would induce hallucinations, yes. but also at that amount might kill you. There's also a lot oh, of stuff yes. that we eat that just like at a larger amount than we traditionally eat would kill you. Full yes. fucking stop. I mean, if so, you eat enough oranges, you will eventually die. That's fair. Uh, but also, if you take enough nuts, you nutmeg, you will hallucinate and then, and then die. die. Yeah. So don't do that. Also, we're not doctors. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're telling you not Full to die. Here. Uh, so but so, don't so do that. Blue Lotus is also a nootropic that can induce hallucinations. Blue Lotus was famously used by the ancient Egyptians, uh, steeped in alcohol, um, like wine. Alcohol? Yeah, alcohol. That's. It's the way it came out. Uh, alcohol, like wine, um, <clears throat> and uh, made into tinctures. It was also infused into oils. Blue Lotus was sort of a piece of everyday type ritual life in um, ancient Egyptian, um, like, sort of upper class and priest class. Uh, but it also played a really large role in the celebratory type of rituals, you know, festivals and stuff like that. And um, it was said that if you had it, you would not only experience like calm and euphoria. These are things that we know about nootropics that they do. Um, you know, you would feel a lot more loose. You'd feel a lot more um, OK in a situation, you know, like no social anxiety. Uh, but you would also oftentimes hallucinate. Now, the thing about natural no nootropics like um, like Blue Lotus or other types of things um, that are not 
chemically made or have been um, bred by humans uh, or created by humans to create a larger punch. You know, like how many people say that cannabis now is stronger than it was like in the 70s. It is. But like, <laughs> um, you know, so those kind of things is not everybody takes those kind of nootropics, right? Not everybody hallucinates. And we actually get some of that um, idea in the movie when um, one of the characters sort of insinuates that like, oh, the spice doesn't do that to me. But like it really causes Paul to hallucinate wildly. Yeah. And it also seems to cause Chani to hallucinate as well. In the books, it's more along the lines of everybody hallucinates. So this is well, essentially so a nootropic that's also a toxin. Technically, which is nobody's common. hallucinating. They are becoming increasingly prescient, yes. which is kind of different. Insofar as prescience is often described as hallucinatory, um, what Spice specifically does in the books and in the movie, but most specifically in the books, is that it increases prescience. It opens yeah. the mind up for prescience, the ability to see the future, right? Or see future events or see forwards, yeah. right? Or further a field, as it were, right? Um, the uh, Fremen are sort of like constantly basting in like a like a small background radiation of the stuff because they live on the sand and they're it's in their food and shit like that uh which in the book they specifically call out as one of the reasons why they're such good fighters like on top yeah. of the fact that their planet is constantly trying to kill them which means that they have to constantly struggle which makes them good fighters they are all also a little bit background prescient which means that they always kind of vaguely can see a little bit into the future yeah right uh, Paul's reaction, Probably because he is supposed to be the um Quisex Hatterach. The Quisex Hatterach. So like, or at least he's in that path of being a Quisex Hatterach, which means that he is like engineered to react to it more strongly. Right. But he also has the mental training of a Bene Gesserit. Well, that just allows him, allow to, handle him it to handle it better, better and be able to manipulate the things that he is seeing, which I've just been saying Control. is hallucinations, right? But not all of these things are hallucinations. Yeah. You know, you're well, not I mean, they're seeing... almost always prescient images, yeah. but it's not always prescient to a chosen reality, right? The future is like constantly unfolding. So there's not one future. There is many futures. Again, stuff that they specifically call out in the book and they only gently hint at in the movies is that Paul can see many futures. Most of these futures are a bloodbath where armies scream his name in godlike worship. Yeah. That's where his fear comes from, because that is the most likely future. He's pulling a he's pulling a Doctor Strange where he's like, I've been to nine thousand or nine million realities and there's only one where this works out like that yeah. kind of shit. He's just basically doing that. Right. Um, when he when he has access to higher and higher doses of the spice. Uh, the Reverend Mothers using spice, not just to increase prescience, but because of the mind opening effect, it allows them to access a plane of consciousness whereupon all Reverend Mothers share information. So like as soon as you take the water of life, which is what it's called on Arrakis, um, although... Uh, I imagine it probably has some sort of separate name for the right of the Reverend Mother yeah. in other worlds, but it's most assuredly the same juice. Yeah. Right? Um, uh, that allows them to access the like Reverend Mother internet, and uh, that way they have memories for all Reverend Mothers who came before them. Yeah. And Jessica, I think in the book, mentions that she can kind of see future Reverend Mothers, but like not clearly. Mostly yeah. the Bene Gesserit are able to access clarity and the past under use of um of spice. Uh the Quisax Hatterak can see into the future, which is what makes that a special person. As well as the past. Well as well as the past and all yeah. the other stuff, right? He can do all three because there's essentially three skills gained from spice yeah right there's the there's the Benny Gesserit skill which is the ability to see into the past and to be able to network with all past reverend mothers yeah avatar the last airbender style style where Aang can access all the other avatars yeah right avatar plane uh 
the spacers and the movie just fucking does not talk about this like at all they're like you gotta have it for spacers and then that's it that's fine trust me it's gonna get weird in later movies so they're just they're just holding <laughs> off the truth it's gotta happen but spacers are genetically modified monsters uh who use it to be able to see further afield they are kind of technically mildly prescient like the um like the people who live on dune are yeah right like fremen like the fremen are but more than prescience they're able to see because they use it to be able to travel uh to be able to pilot their ships faster than light they use it to plot courses so they can it opens their mind to like where things will be in the future not little things like people or decisions or actions but big things like stars and planets so they can plot the course for their faster than light travel this is what makes the spacers special they're the only ones who can do that it's also because they are their own genetic breed just like the Bene Gesserit it also or, or the Mintats yeah it also makes it is one of the main reasons why spice is so important. Without spice, there's no faster than light travel. Yeah. Like, you are asking to get slammed into a black yeah, hole. Yeah, that's just... Or, like, come out of light travel in the middle of a fucking star or something. So, like, it that that is why it's as important as it is. Like, yeah, the Jesu Bene Gesserit's need it for superpowers or whatever the fuck, but the spacers literally can't pilot these ships without it. Yeah. And yeah. they need a lot of it. Yeah, so what does spice sound like? Spice sounds like a lot of things that we're familiar with here they sell it sounds like nootropics it sounds like hallucinin lsd lsd D uh, DMT, dmt mushrooms mushrooms it sounds like astral projection it sounds yeah. like astral travel it sounds like um reaching the akashic records yeah it it, it, it sounds is, like it is communing with your higher that self allows you to do that next thing that your mind is engineered to do Right. Yeah. Bene Gesserit use that spice in a specific way. Yeah. The the spacers use it in a specific way. Paul and his sister use it in a specific way. Yeah. Right. Because they're capable of using it in a special way. Right. Yeah. Uh that also technically implies that Fade Rautha would, under enough spice, gain prescience because he was part of the line of could be um uh Quisax Hatterax. Yeah. Right? Which means that with he he wasn't on the planet for very long and he was only exposed to background spice in the air and like maybe a little bit of food. Right. And like maybe a bump of spice, but like n clearly not enough to gain that full access. Yeah. Right. Uh, but he would have gained a small amount of prescience if he had been on the planet for long. Yeah. Right. And potentially he could have gained even more, although he never had the training of a Betty Jesuit like Paul did to be able to uh, take, take on the water of life. Like Paul did. And the water of life is basically just like if if spice is LSD, water of life is DMT. Um, you see what I'm saying? It's like yeah. it's the bigger hallucinogen. Well, I don't I, I I don't agree that it's a bigger hallucinogen. I mean it's, it's it's such a bigger hallucinogen that if you aren't trained to keep your body from dying, it kills you and yeah. no men can take it. Yeah, but that's not the difference between DMT and LSD. Well, yes, yes, um, yes, yes. Obviously, it's like not well. I mean, kind of. You you get real sick with when you do ayahuasca. The like yeah, natural but it's form still, of DMT. It's but, still not but, the same thing. But but the the reason why I'm, why I'm making that delineation is that you have to delineate like strength, right? Like obviously dosage matters. Yeah. But like DMT is just like a significantly harder hitting. It's a bigger punch than LSD. Mm -hmm. Just like LSD is a bigger punch than mushrooms. And mushrooms are a bigger punch than, like, let's say, blue lotus. See, These are I just orders of magnitude. I don't look at in them trip. as magnitude of trip. I look at them as difference in trip. I mean, they are different trips. I'm yeah. not saying they're the same trip, but you know, like pound for pound, right? Yeah, you're, you're just talking about bigger boxers. You're just talking about heavier wrestlers. Yeah, so you know what I'm saying? Of, less of it's less the about water the of difference life. of trip, and it's more about just the. Physical, like same volume, way harder punch to the face. Yeah, you're going right? to get more mileage, so to speak, yeah. out of the water of life than you would with yeah. spice. Well, you're essentially yeah. going to get either infinite mileage or no more mileage. <laughs> yeah, right. And for most, ninety nine percent no mileage. Yeah, right. You yeah. put that shit in your gas tank. That's just sugar in your gas tank. That car ain't making it out of the lot. 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so this is a relatively magical thing here, although really a lot of the Dune stuff is sort of rooted in this, is it magic? Not really, but also kind of yes, if you believe that it is. Totally. So like that's definitely a theme that you see with all of these sort of magical well, I mean, pieces. I mean, so okay, so this this is gonna this is gonna transition us into the third question, which is how do the prophetic visions in Dune work? So how does that prescience work? Yeah. In Dune. That's the third question. Uh and like obviously the like straight line answer is like, oh, because you did spice, dog. Her <laughs> her. Right? <laughs> That's why it. I, Next question. Why am I tripping balls? Done. I don't know, because you ate all those tiny pieces of paper, motherfucker. Why do you think? <laughs> right? Like her dur. But but this actually brings up a larger question, which is which is like, okay, so <laughs> Dune essentially has kind of three distinct types of prescience. Yeah. Right? They have your standard issue background prescience. This is like what the um what the Fremen have. This is what um like arguably the Bene Gesserit kind of have, but not really it's not like super explored. Yeah. Uh but where they like they're not seeing the future, right? But they're getting like vibes that I get stabbed over there if I go over there. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. So like think about it like you have to think about that kind of prescience specifically in the formation of combat. Right? It's not it's not I'm seeing that if I fight that guy, I'm gonna die. It's that while I'm fighting that guy, there's like pressure in that direction. So when I'm going to make a feint, I can feel pressure that way, so I'll faint the opposite direction because there's something over there, right? It's like totally not future sight, hallucinatory, you know, like, ugh, like I'm seeing visions, like you see in the movie what, what Paul has. Yeah. Right? Paul is like a fuck, his own beast, we will get there, right? But what the Fremen and what I, the Bene Gesserit to an extent have is like, what I think of as the lowest grade form of prescience, which is more like combat pressure right it's sort of like you know when you're like doing something like if you cook a lot you kind of get that thing where you're like you're like doing a thing like uh making a roux is a fantastic example of like it's not really prescience it's like 99 percent skill but you have that where you're like stirring and you're stirring you're stirring you're stirring you're like going and going and going and you get that vibe where you're just like i'm gonna slide this can of like tomato uh like tomato chunks closer to me because like this shit is about ready to pop and as soon as it hits Copper Penny, I like I got to kill. I got to steal as much heat from that as I can to like stop that cooking process. Yeah. You know, so, you know, or like when you're deep frying something or you're like cooking a burger where you're just like, oh, it's time to flip it. You know, yeah. or like, oh, that's medium rare. You didn't touch it and you weren't really paying attention to time, but you just like it's like vibes. Well, vibes and repetition and skill. Yeah. Yes. Right. Well, and and that's the thing is, is that the, their style of prescience is like vibes and repetition and skill. Yeah. Right. For the Bene Gesserits, it's like intense, infinite training to work towards these goals. And for the Fremen, it's again, this whole ass planet is trying to kill you. There's like no water. The sand gets all fucking wormy real quick. Like. Like it, or not, loud. Right, or loud. Everybody who visits this place is like, we're going to piss off the worms, which is a terrible decision, and try and murder you. So fucking good luck, dog. Right? Like yeah. everything about the Fremen lifestyle is like a nightmare. Yeah. Right? Uh, so like part of it is that training and that constant combating because like combat is such an important part of their culture. Right? But part of it is also that like low grade prescience Right, that yeah. low grade future sight that they get from being essentially constantly exposed to like background. You know, they're doing the like the dude who invented LSD um at like Berkeley or whatever. And I don't know how true the story is, but like the way that I've heard it told is that like once he started doing LSD, he was like a spoonful of morning makes everything go great. And which sounds insane. I mean, like it stops being hallucinatory at like certain thresholds of you taking it that constantly. Yeah. Right. But he just like you just like backgrounded a tablespoon of LSD every morning for shits and gigs, right? Yeah. Um, which is that guy, every story about that dude is an absolute nightmare. The discovery of LSD was him doing chemical science and then coming home and making tea and using the spoon he used in his chemistry science to mix his tea. And then he took the tea and was like, everything's awesome. 
I gotta figure out what that was. Which is like, what if that was like acid or bubonic plague or something, dog? What is wrong with you? We bad science be in a different place. Today. Dude, bad science, dude. You know, <laughs> so like, and like whatever. But so like, so there's that like low grade prescience, right? It's a little like micro dosing. It, it's totally micro dosing yeah. is like way more accurate. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's like it's micro like micro dosing. Yeah, yeah, right. So it's just like it's it's like yeah, let's loosen it up. You're more creative. More creativity's flowing or whatever the hell yeah. people do micro dosing yeah. for. Um. So like so there's that right and then you've got again not talked about in the movie only in the books thus far uh is the spacers which their prescience is like hyper specific right yeah it's specifically around piloting and not again slamming into shit at the speed of light yeah yeah or fast so they're not really seeing the same kind of like uh, you know a, a spacer so a, a pilot basically for lack of better for lack of better terms, is like Navigator, not going yeah. to see the same things as Paul is seeing. No. Well, it's like, that's my just understanding not the that, thing they're that they're not really for. seeing the future. They can just like it, it's like, like if you've ever like hiked to the top of a mountain, right? And you like get like you break the top of the mountain and all of a sudden instead of seeing a hundred feet in front of you, now you're seeing 10 miles in front of you yeah right where you just have this like vista of of yeah. information so to my understanding the way that their prescience their their far sight works is that it is a significantly more practical and physical thing yeah and doesn't really have anything to do with time although technically it does have to do with time because of the necessary time dilation that occurs at faster than light travel blah 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 physics but like they're simply elevating themselves higher up. They're, be, they're on a higher mountain so they can see further, so they can be like, hey, it's like a bunch of fucking boats out there. They're just the dude in the bloody crow's nest on a boat. Captain on the yeah, captain's deck on a boat. But they're using no, no boats the coming spice to, to climb get up. Yeah, as the spice is just to, the elevator. As opposed to using the spice, they're using the spice to climb upwards as opposed to like, for instance, Paul is using the spice to move forwards in time not yeah. upwards but forwards and he also has the ability to move backwards in time like his mother does yeah you know so you're they're essentially using the same thing but for a different purpose yes yeah 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 totally 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 so and, and then of course you have paul or i would argue any of the candidates any of the like late stage candidates for um Kwisak's Haderach, have the capacity to take on enough spice to go full prescience. Yeah. Or they're able to see uh, with training the myriad potential unfoldings of time. Yeah. Right. The backwards thing is like mostly to do with the water of life and mostly to do with the whole Reverend Mother thing. Although the water of life is like a pure form of spice it's like baby spice not the girl one because <laughs> baby spice is one of the spice yes ones. um but you know they do make a point spice up your life <laughs> so <laughs> yeah i can't argue with that right i'm sure you were i, I was not expecting that as i wasn't expecting it either and uh and and it just yeah. happens. So yeah, I think that spice of these things that we've talked about so far has the largest potential use in magic because we know that going back in time, like priests, like both yeah, Abrahamic herbs, priests, herbs. but also like priests throughout the things, love doing using herbs, herbs bro. using drugs, yeah. using low grade poisons yeah. to achieve sometimes high grade states. poisons and not achieving it for very long. Um, to be real, you know, like we know that that's a thing. He that, lost a lot uh, of hominids. To I wonder what that mushroom does. And yeah. then that guy's over there foaming at the mouth, and you're like, all right, well, don't eat that color. I wonder what that mushroom does. And that guy's over there like licking a tree, and you're like, maybe eat that color. <laughs> maybe we'll yeah. see what happens in 20 minutes yeah so like you we, know? we have we know that like people have used um you know 
altered states, yeah. shall we say. Mind-altering uh, drugs. To be quotes able to commune with divine, to receive prophecies, to receive information about like religious visions, texts, to see the visions, future, communing with deity, potentially to travel faster the than the speed of light. I'm just saying, the spice. I mean, astral projection. So yes, kind of. Yeah, kind uh, of, you know. Yeah. So we know that that's a thing that people use altered states to access. So I think of these, the one that is the least like, is it magic? Is it not magic? Is this one? Yeah. Well, insofar as I, I think that I, I think that like the the spice as a structure is a non magical chemical that accomplishes tasks relative to how you're trained to use them. Right. In like it, it is the herb. It is the tincture. It is the poultice. It is the sensor. It is the the you know the mushroom or the tablespoon because it's the 60s or whatever the fuck was going on with that guy right it, you know it's it's wh however you make ayahuasca bark in a pot or something i, I don't know um so like it, it is the it is the assistant in that thing but i think that the the more mystical and magical side of the spice conversation is specifically how the spice is used by its users, right? Yeah. If you think of the Bene Gesserit as a priest class, which is fucking basically what they are. Yeah. Right? A priestess class, whatever. Right? They're, they're a holy order, for lack of better words. Right? They're using a, a, a magical herb to assist them in being able to accomplish their goals. Yeah. Right? If you think of the spacers as a priest class, as a sort of cosmic shaman who's able to predict the motion of the stars in order to plot a safe course to travel faster than the speed of light which would make sense to call them shamans then they are using that same herb that same magic poultice right mix up drink whatever the heck right and they're still using that thing to produce a different thing right because they're trained in a different practice right yeah uh, and just the same paul one of the chosen few who have been trained and selected to be a Quisa Tatarak, right, is capable of using that same spice, that same herb, for pure prescience, the capacity to see forwards in time. Yeah. Right? And predict what is to come. And just the same, a slightly different version of that herb, but still that same essential herb, the water of life, can be used by those Bene Gesserit trained highly enough to become a reverend mother, right, who, who've experienced enough to become a reverend mother, are able to use that to essentially just, like, bookmark where they need to go in the bloody Akashic record so that way when they're just like, oh, man, this is a real tough decision. Okay, Brenda said I shouldn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever, right? So, um, so like, I, I think that it is both the most mystical as well as the most grounded in our reality, yeah. if you start thinking of the people who use it as simply different classes of priesthood, yeah. right? If the spacers are shamans and the and the um uh the Bene Gesserit are a priest class and the uh Quisettes Hatteraks are sort of like um what do you call those like three ladies in Greek mythology? The uh, Norns. Norns, yeah, right. Or um, like seers of some sort yeah. like that, right? Then you start seeing how like you're basically using the same like five, you know, neurochemicals to fire stuff up in here, right? And but how you're using it is what changes. And yeah. it's entirely based on training as well as experience. Because I mean, you know, in the first movie, Paul is like takes a little dirt nap in some sand even before that. Yeah. Right. When he when he first stumbles outside and he just gets like a like a like a bit of dust in the face. That dude him that dude is locked the fuck in. Yeah, dude. Like, he almost died so hard. Well, he already had like a a natural prescience, and I think that what happened there. Oh, is it unlocked the spice it. Just like yeah, it, it not just like unlocks it, yeah. but it's. It, it just Kool-Aid man the little, side yeah. of his fucking house in. A little bit just, goes a long just, way. Oh yeah, and he was just like. Ugh. 
right? Yeah. You know, and then like when after him and Jessica escape after after the killing of his of you know his family or whatever his house, right? And he's like in that tent and is just like losing his marbles, yeah, because he's now experienced so much of it and not been in filtered air for long enough, yeah. and the stress which as which has weakened the the uh resolves he built in his head, the barriers he built in his mind to hold back that background prescience that was always already there. Right. Yeah. That just has like, I mean, it's basically like when he went out there with his dad, Kool-Aid man just kicked him and jumped through his fucking wall and he put up some visqueen. Like, I'm going to take care of that shit. Right. Two days later, everybody's dead. He's having to sleep in a bathtub full of the stuff. Right. Yeah. So, of course, the, that visqueen's getting torn down. Your house is blowing over. Dog, you are my bad. You're an outside guy now. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so like he kind of got good luck on that. And that's when he has that like first initial freak out about it. Yeah. Right. And I would almost argue that that sort of sets the tone for most of his future prescience where like that first time was so terrifying and so bad that he's more he, he more easily accesses the like fields of death and not the things that can come from such fields. Yeah. You know, because it's not until later on, it's not until he gains enough confidence and enough practice, right, and all that kind of stuff, where he sees, like, I can, you know, I can turn Dune into a green paradise. Yeah. I can unify the cosmos. I can, like, you know, repay the debts my family owe is owed and shit like that. Yeah. Right? And, the, and, and I think that that has to do with the fact that his initial experience was so shocking. Right. And also surrounded, I mean, bathed in blood yeah, of the worst possible order. Right. That he saw the worst possible things and that colored that colored his fear. Yeah. You know, you know, it's it's that like, well, you know, I don't want to have a bad trip. Well, if you keep saying you're going to have a bad trip, like. Maybe, dog. Then you're maybe speaking that into. Yeah. Like, stop. Yeah. yeah stop trying to speak that into, into existence, my homie. You know, like that kind of yeah, energy or yeah, whatever. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that Dune is very much a practical look uh, or a practical application of magical and mystical practices. Yes. Right? And I and like, th that's what I take away from it. And that's how I it, apply the knowledge and act of Dune, it, like interacting with the Dune franchise to myself, right? And I've talked about this before. Where, like, I'm very much so, uh, like, every book you read, every TV show you watch, there's a lesson in it that can be applied somewhere in your life. Yeah. Right? It's that, it's that like, everything I ever learned, I learned from Star Trek energy. Mm -hmm. Right? And so it's like, what can we take away from Dune? Right? And then how can we apply that to ourselves for, in both a practical, like, everyday sort of a way, as well as in our mystical or magical practices? Yeah. Right? Uh, and so, like, I again, I think it's that, like, very bare bones practicality and like the force of will to to use the tools you have in the manner in which benefits you the most. Yeah. Right. Spacer don't need to see the future. He certainly don't need to access the Akashic record. For sure, for sure. That's how you slam into a star. Right? Yeah. You fucking waste of time if that guy's just like flipping through pages in the Akashic. They don't realize that they're about ready to fucking de warp into the center of a yeah. black hole or some shit. You know, so like I, to me, that's that like practically use the stuff that you have available to you to improve yourself. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Totally. Totally. Yeah. So uh, those are our thoughts. Those are our thoughts on, on those things. Those, uh, those so things. Again, the, the questions were the questions were uh, how does the voice work from Dune? Uh, is Spice from Dune basically just LSD? And how do the prophetic visions of Dune work? And I think that we covered all three of those things. I think so, too. Yeah. <coughs> so, um... Let us know what you think. What do you think, think about it? What are your thoughts on Are we totally things? wrong? Did we forget something? Because maybe we did. Yeah. I read Dune, like, three books ago. <laughs> so... <laughs> and we haven't watched the movies in at least, like, a couple of months. Yeah. So... Like month. More like a month, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let us know what yeah, you let think. Let us know what you think about that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, would you do Spice... Were spice available, and would you try, uh, whatever that water is called, water of life? Yes, and yes. Because a hundred percent, like, I, uh, it's real poisonous, and dudes can't do it. I'm gonna be like, all right, but like, I already drank it while you were trying to explain that shit to me because I don't care what you said right now. <laughs> I did that. That's for yeah, yeah. Right. That is that answering the call shit. Like every every hero in every anime is just like, I don't know if I want to be the hero. You shut the fuck up. 
you be the hero. Yeah. It's a hundred percent my entire mentality. It's just like answer the call. Was there a knock at the door? Answer that call. Some dude knocks at the door, sunglasses on and a dark suit with a blacked out windows SUV out there. It's gonna be like, we need your help. I'm in. You don't even tell me what agency you're from. I am in. <laughs> Let's punch some ETs. Right? Like very here for answering the call. Yeah. Right? Uh so yeah, what do you think about that? Would you do the spice? Or the water of life? Comment below about that kind of stuff, and we will catch you guys next time for more uh, mystical, magical mayhem in these uh, Horn and Cauldron pub chat editions. So, uh, yeah, either way, I've been John Norgrove. This has been Julie Norgrove. This has been the Horn and Cauldron podcast, podcast. Uh, pub chat edition. I'm out of drink, so Same. it's time to be over, and we will catch you guys next time. Stay magical, folks. Yeah, and don't forget. Breathe in self-confidence and breathe out self-doubt.